This conference will now be recorded. Good evening and welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting of May 1st, 2023. Call the order, please. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Here. Councilmember Mitchell? Here. Councilmember Noah? Here. Councilmember Walchek? Here. And Mayor Walagora? Here. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, approval of the agenda for this evening. The approved agenda is printed. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? Yes. And Mayor Walgora? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Any proposed modifications to the agenda? No. Sure. Okay. Approve the minutes for regular session of April 17th, 2023. Any issues, changes? No. Okay. Citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. This is the only time during our council meeting this evening that you're allowed to address council. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address to our clerk for her records. No one here in the room, anyone on the internet? Thank you, Charlie. Tonight's consent agenda A is bills to be allowed uh, in the amount of $234,587.86 and authorize Mayor Walagora and Clerk Zoic to sign. He is approval of Alpina Flower Festival on June 2nd and 3rd, 2023, organized by the Downtown Development Authority. C is the approval of a noise ordinance variance request from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for the resurfacing project on Ripley Boulevard from Washington Avenue to 3rd Avenue from May 15th, 2023 to May 21st, 2023. Uh, D is the approval of a contract modification number one for custodial services contract to expire December 31st, 2023 with current facility cleaning rates and special cleaning project rates remaining the same. And E is the approval of Don Gilmet as alternate for representatives Cindy Johnson and Rachel Smolinski to the Northeast Michigan Materials Management Authority Board. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. <coughs> Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Councilmember Walchuk? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Potan Johnson? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, now we're down to a report of officers. First is a second reading of ordinance number 23-488, which amends the city of Alpena zoning ordinance article two, construction of language and definitions and article four signs. Bill? Uh, consistent with council policy, this would not be read again. The only change, I think, from the last uh, or from first reading was on page 16 and 23 under A13. Some extra, a few extra uh, words in there that shouldn't have been there. So that was removed. Um, so at this point, just need to vote yes or no. Okay, I don't have any questions, no one. I'll entertain a motion to, uh, to um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for for the ordinance? <laughs> approve it? I don't know, do we approve it? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. um, I move we approve uh, ordinance number 23-488. Second. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Proton Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mayor Mitchell? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Next up is the second reading of Ordinance 23-489, which amends the City of Alpena zoning map. Uh, once again, was uh, less council wants, this would not be read again. Uh, there were no changes from the first reading, so just need a vote to approve or not approve. I move we approve Ordinance number 23-489. Second. <coughs> Councilmember Walchuk? Yes. Mayor Walgora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Noah? Yes. Motion carried. 
Thank you. Next is a second reading of Ordinance 23-490, which amends the City of Alpena zoning map. Uh, once again, unless Council uh, asks for it to be read, it would not be read again. There were no changes from first reading, so just need a vote uh, approved or not approved. I, I move we approve Ordinance number 23-490. Second. Oops, go ahead, Danny. Second was to Mitchell. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jansen? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. And Councilmember Wolchek? Yes. Motion carried. All right, thank you. Next is the fiscal year 2023 2024 preliminary budget presentation by Anna Zoic, our finance director. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, I would just like to thank anybody that had a part in creating this. Um, it is a project that starts many months ahead of, well, it started many months ago. Um, so department heads, Rachel, uh, my staff, big appreciation for everyone's help in this. Um, so we're on the right page. So this is, as you remember in previous years, uh, our charter says exactly how it's supposed to be presented. So this uh, particular slide is a brief and concise budget summary showing the estimated receipts and expenditures of each fund and the total of all funds, a statement of the estimated financial condition of each city fund reflecting the estimated surplus or deficit in each such fund. I won't go through each and every fund, I'll just do the general one. Um, <clears throat> so the first number column is the fiscal year 23 revenues where we estimate to end the current year. That is 10.9 million. We anticipate ending the expenditures at 11.4 million, which would leave a deficit of 457,323 for fiscal year 23. We had originally projected to lower the fund balance by 608,000 if you recall when we passed the budget last year. Um, the fiscal year 24 revenues, we are projecting to be 11.7 million and the fiscal 24 expenditures to be 12.7 million for a deficit of $932,121. Yes, that is very large. Um, but I feel confident in it because there are some things that we may potentially get that are not in this budget. And the reason that it's not in the budget, like the personal property tax reimbursement is what I'm referring to, is something that we have gotten for many years now. It's a, a reimbursement that we get in May, and we don't know ahead of time what it's going to be, and they always tell us not to budget for it because it's not a guarantee. So it's not in this number. Um, fund balance at June 30 was $4.3 million, and we are estimating the fund balance at um, the end of 23 to be 3.9 million and the estimated fund balance at fiscal 24 to be just over $3 million. Um, general fund uh, did end at 41.5% unassigned fund balance for fiscal year 22. So the 457, um, I think it's it would take it down to about 34%. Um, and then if we if we uh, lower it by 932,000 in next fiscal year, that would take it down to about 22%, 23% on assigned fund balance. Just so healthy. It is. It's still over our fund balance policy maximum of 20%. So uh, some of the things that caused that is uh, our pension fund uh, contribution went up by 180,000. And more of that is affecting, more of it's being moved to the general fund because there was, um, there was three retirees from the building inspection fund. So a large part of the pension payment was going to that fund. Um, and now it, they're not there, so we don't, we don't charge anything there. It's all coming back to the general fund. But it also 
we used to do a larger transfer from the general fund to account for that. So we don't have to do that anymore. <clears throat> Any questions on that? No? Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. This one is an estimate of the amount of money proposed to be raised by taxation and the amount to be raised from bond issues, which together with the estimated income from other sources will be necessary to meet the proposed expenditures. So on the left side, we have the general fund and we are estimating revenue from taxation to be 4.6 million. Total estimated revenue from other sources is 7.1 million for a total of 11.7 million estimated general fund expenditures again is 12.7 million for a reduction from fund balance of 932,121 um the operating millage is currently at 16.0373 and for the upcoming tax year, we're going to have to take a truth and assessing um, reduction. So that is going to take us down to like 15.9, um, but it's not permanent. So that's assuming that the calculations next year come out in our favor. Um, Whichever way it, the calculations come out depends on, that's how it affects the, the operating millage. Um, but we can never go higher than 16.03 unless it goes um, as a vote to the, the voters in the city. Um, so that would also affect dial -a ride They would also have to do the truth in assessing reduction. Um, but the the DDA, they still would have the same millage as last year. Um, they have their own set of taxable values, so theirs were not affected. Um, on the right side of the screen is the authority for brownfield redevelopment, and we expect to receive three thousand dollars in revenues for um, six hundred Walnut Street, and. Also expenditures of 3,000, I, I believe that's the transfer to the general fund, so it'd be a zero reduction from fund balance. The DDA, we are estimating uh, revenue from taxation to be 177,000, and re estimated revenue from other sources is 31,652. Total estimated revenue for the DDA is $209,294, and estimated expenditures to be 213,134 for a reduction from fund balance of 3,840. And the DDA does have fund balance um, on the previous page. Uh, fund balance at June 30, 22 was 233,530. So that is how we are able to pass a deficit budget. Same thing with the general fund. As long as you have fund balance, it's okay to do that. That's basically balanced. Um, next page, please. This one is detailed statements of estimates of all anticipated income of the city from sources other than current taxes and borrowing, compared with the amounts received by the city from each of the same or similar resources for the last preceding and for the current year. Receipts for the current year shall be computed as the actual receipts to April 1st, plus the estimated receipts for April, May, and June. So these, these next pages here are all very detailed um, estimated revenues for all of the funds. Would you like to go through line by line? <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. I don't want to either. <laughs> okay. Anything with revenues? Any questions on that? No? Okay. Um, Charlie, if you could go down to the expense. Yep, that one right there. Yeah. Okay, um, so this one is basically set up the same way as the revenue part of it, except this one is going to include after this um, a statement of all salaries paid to city officials itemized for each department. Oh, wait. Um, It's a statement of the detailed estimates of all proposed expenditures for each fund, including a statement of all salaries paid to city officials. 
itemized for each department and activity by objects of expenditure, showing in parallel columns the expenditures for the preceding year, the appropriation and expenditures for the current year, and the recommendations of the city manager as to the appropriations to be made for the ensuing year including an appropriation for contingencies and showing the increases or decreases in the recommended appropriations over the expenditures for the current year. Expenditures for the current year shall be comp computed as the actual expenditures to April 1st plus the estimated expenditures for April, May, and June. That is a mouthful. Any questions on the expenditures? Okay. So we can go past this whole section and we'll go to um, we'll go to the salaries so I have to show that right there okay um, so for the council it has not yet been determined what it's going to be for calendar year 24 um, so the compensation committee will be meeting at some point this year. They have to meet well before the end of the calendar year because um, it's only figured out so far through the end of the current year. Um, the city manager and the city attorney uh, both have 3% raises. Uh, myself and the city engineer, the two police or the police chief, the fire chief, and the planning and development director all have a step plus three percent um, a couple of us are now at the top of our steps and would only be getting the raises each year that the scale goes up by and the city building official is still under contract next page please This one is a statement of the bonded and other indebtedness of the city showing the amount required in the ensuing fiscal year for retirement of principal on the debt for interest and for a sinking fund for term bonds if such a fund is required. Left side on the top is the state revolving loan fund. This was originally, um, this bond was issued in September of 2007 for $3.2 million. And we've got, seven years left to go, seven more payments, and including interest, it's 1.3 left to pay on that one. Below that is the SRF, DWRF, ineligible expenses. That was for 995,000 back in July, 2007. And we have five years left on that one with 402,500 left to be paid. Up on the top right is the building authority, the DPW building. That bond was for 1,525,000 and was issued in May of 2013. And we have seven years left on that with an outstanding balance of $860,980. The drinking water revolving fund was originally issued for 3.1 million in September, 2007 seven years left of payments with 1.24 million outstanding. Um, the recap down at the bottom, water and sewer funds, between those two funds, there's 2.74 million of debt. Uh, the, this must be principal debt. Yeah, this is principal debt. Um, 775,000 for building authority DPW building. So the grand total all principal debt is 3.5 million. Last year we paid 460,000 and in fiscal year 24, we will be paying 485,000 in principal. Any questions on that one? Oh. Is whatever that is in the room? Yeah, I think so. Somebody's going. I don't think it's fine. Sorry. I'm starting to think it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hear anything. <laughs> Cindy heard it. It stopped now. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, this screen is a statement of outstanding delinquent taxes and special assessments, which have been levied during the current and preceding fiscal years of the city, and an estimate of the amount thereof, which may reasonably be expected to be collected or realized upon during the next fiscal year of the city. 
So we currently have, um, so this report was ran on April 17th. We have 67 um, outstanding parcels. Since that report was run, we've collected on nine parcels. Um, they all pertain to uh, tax year 22. So we're actually down to 58 parcels left to collect. Um, the 2017, so we have to keep five, five tax years on, on the roll um, and we can strike anything older than that. So that would be the 2017 year. Um, there's only three parcels and it's only valued at $135. So I don't think it's a good decision to pay a $175 filing fee to get rid of that. So I'm gonna wait till next year to get rid of 17. <laughs> you get the year off Bill. <laughs> um, so a large majority of this is expected to be stricken. Um, because of the biorefinery. Um, we do expect to um, collect $16,510. Well, that's for all entities and our share of that is $5,400, but we've already collected some of that in these nine parcels. I just don't know that number. Okay. Waiving or biorefinery's taxes. Is that included in this or no? No. Okay. Um, that the first year for that is 2018, and we can't strike 18 until next year. Now, if they pay on that, though, we apply it to them. We will. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we did receive some. We received or we paid off 16 and 17. And then there's a little bit left over. Um, the last page of this part is the organizational funding. Um, we used to always give 20,000 to the Humane Society, but they have requested 22,500 this year and it's in the budget. Um, Target Alpina is 40,000. Thunder Bay Arts Council only needed 1,000 this year, if you recall from Mr. Kuhnlein's presentation. The Wildlife Sanctuary, um, 5,000 for the River Center and 2,800 in miscellaneous projects. 8,000 for the Huron Undercover Narcotics Team and 20,000 for the Park Family Foundation for a total of 99,300. Any questions on that part? There's just a few things I wanted to point out in the preliminary budget. Um, Charlie, if you could please go to page six. Um, there are page numbers in this document. Okay. Um, so the CIP projects that were approved by the council and the planning commission in February. Um, that total was over $10 million. And after going through the budget and seeing what we were expecting for revenues, 8.8 um, .8 million made it in. So I think that's like 180,000 that didn't. So that's pretty good. Um, there are a few projects in here that were not in CIP that made it into the budget. Um, one of them that I'm looking at on the previous page here is the um, water production plant clear well replacement. That was not in CIP and it's now in the budget for $500,000. Um, uh, there was under the police um, upfitting new police vehicles. We didn't have anything in CIP and now we put in $34,972. That. Yeah, it looks like there's only two of them. Um, so in, okay, as I mentioned earlier, our pension payment uh, went up by 180,000. In the current fiscal year, we paid $1,035,096, and it's going up to 1,215,421. Our largest source of revenue for the city comes from property taxes. 
the total taxable value increased from 269,772,000 dollars in 22 to 287,474,936 for, for uh, tax year 23, which is an increase of over 7%. If you recall from last year, we looked at that historical list and um, I believe it was 6.43% was the increase last year and that was one of the highest and now we're at 7%. So even though our uh, taxable or our operating millage is gonna go down a little bit, our taxable value went up. So we should expect to receive more tax revenue um, I did budget conservatively for that. Um, I didn't want to, I don't budget for every dollar we, it looks like we're going to receive. I, I kind of figure out based on our track record of what we actually collect. Cause I don't want to spend money that we don't have. Um, our second largest source of revenue is for ambulance transport services in Fiscal year 22, the city received 940,000 in an agreement with the county and 1.37 million in ambulance transport fees. It's projected that the, that the city will receive a total of 2.29 million in fiscal year 23 and two point, well, the same in 24. The state revenue sharing is the third largest source of revenue and brought in nearly 1.49 million in fiscal 22. It's projected at 1.5 million for fiscal year 23 and 1.52 million for fiscal 24. And I don't know why I always leave this line in here. It says for comparison, the city received 1.7 million in 2002. <laughs> I guess it's just to show how high it was 21 years ago. <laughs> um, another thing that I want to go to is on page 40. This is the projected fund balance for the general fund. I'll wait till Charlie gets there. Okay. Um, as I've mentioned, we are projecting a deficit of 932,121 and 457,323 for the current fiscal year. And when we, oh, and then if we bring in the 4.3 million from fiscal 22, we have numerous lines that we're committing some of that unassigned fund balance to. So for instance, we've got 40,357 for fiber optic maintenance, 60,524 for the river center and so on. Um, when looking just at the unassigned portion, after taking in those deficits for 23 and 24, we are projecting mm -hmm. to have an unassigned fund balance at fiscal year end of 24 at 23% with a 24% total fund balance if we include these committed amounts. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the ARPA fund on page 109. There you go. So these projects um, were approved by the council last year. And I just wanted to put in here a status of them. Um, the police body cameras is still a project that is in progress for $45,865. And then we've got four projects that are complete, have been fully um, expensed what we could what we allocated for the project and the ARPA funds. So $9,995 to repair ramps at skate park, $20,293 for radar speed signs, $5,326 for council chamber AV upgrades, and $20,000 for the fire department kitchen upgrades. 
there's a couple projects that we had in there that have since been canceled. Um, the asset management software for water and sewer, that was, I think, 17,000. 17, um, and then 306,000, I think, for the Culligan Plaza renovations. Um, we had to get creative with that. Yeah, so the, I just wanna make it clear that the Culligan Plaza renovations have not been canceled as a project. But we realized as we were um, applying for this grant and given the scope of the project now that it has to be grant funded because we're never going to have enough money even with ARPA to um, fund the current scope of the project. So we will keep applying for grants until we get that, but then that was reallocated to a couple of other projects, mm -hmm. which Anna will talk about here. Yep. So in fiscal year 24, um, we've got 700,000 for Bayview Public Restrooms. Then this is kind of out of order, but um, the City Hall window replacement was our next project that we wanted to fully fund. Um, it is, the project is actually 250,000 is what we're um, projecting the expense of that project to be. We have another source of revenue um, that we're anticipating of 60,000. We haven't received that yet, but that's that's what's expected to be. So 190 from ARPA funds. And then what was left over is 54,699 and we wanted to um, transfer that to the equipment fund and then commit it for a future purchase of the fire truck. So that would fully, I believe this would, well, other than the interest, I believe this would fully fund, uh, use up the ARPA funds. We have probably, I think we're projecting about 20,000 so far total in investment income on the ARPA funds. That'll be nice. That is all I have. Fit. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on anything related to the budget? Not particularly for me. Nope. I had a list of odds and ends ones. I'll just send them to everybody, but I forgot my list. Odd questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I look forward to them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any more? <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Um, so that was titled a preliminary budget presentation. Do we need to receive and file that, I suppose, or? Yes. I do? Okay. I move we receive and file. Second. <clears throat> Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Council Member Mitchell? Yes. Council Member Nowak? Yes. Council Member Walchuk? Yes. Mayor Walgora? Aye. Great. Thank you. Next up is new business, uh, resolution 2023-09, which approves the application for neighborhood enterprise zone certificate for Peak Services LLC. And Montiel is here for that. So this is the first neighborhood enterprise certificate application that I've received since I've been on staff. And this is for the property located at 113 South 2nd Avenue. It's apartment A, which is facing 2nd Avenue above the Black Sheep. Um, neighborhood enterprise zones are um, for properties that are new or rehabilitated, which this one would be considered rehabilitated. There's a process for looking at the valuation of the amount of work that's going into uh, the project, what the true cash value is of the property, which we consult our assessor on, and that's noted as um, just under 30,000. Construction value valuation is 30,000. And then there are points assigned for different categories, and I have those listed. So one is the project valuation, two is how many units, character of design, and then interior amenities. So there were a total of nine points awarded, and that those points and that review is conducted by city staff members. Um, nine points on our current matrix equates to a six year abatement term. So um, that's what we would be recommending um, if approved would be six. Um, that 
is about half of the full term length. Um, you could go up to 12 um, generally, um, but we've recommended six. Any questions? Have we, and I was gonna ask this earlier, but um, now is fine. And this was your first since you've been on staff and, and we've had a few since I've been here Primarily, I think, in where the old Thunder Bay Junior High was. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember one ever being as an apartment. Are they, have we done apartments before that I'm just not aware of? Like, so I'll, I just don't remember. I'll go back. Um, I was part of when the NEZ first started, and we started it downtown um, as an overlay to, to encourage business owners to put residential above their business. Oh, okay. So one of the very first ones was above the old bookstore. It's, I think it's now still a bookstore. Um, Craig Patterson used it quite a few times. And I think they did at one point too, they had an NEZ. They didn't have an NEZ, they made use of the, um, Oh, the grants that they were giving, you know, the match grants. Right, for yeah, making I remember grants. those. So I think, and this is just me, I'm on this committee um, and sat through this. Um, when, we, when we first developed this NEZ program, it was for residential apartments. Um, that you wanted to get people downtown, you wanted it to be lively, people to live down there, you know, you. You worked out where they would park, all of that. Um, and I wasn't aware when I, when I first sat down in this meeting that this particular, and it's rehabbing one, an existing apartment. But I think there's a broader question here on short-term rentals. Because I wasn't aware, because there's nowhere in the application that says, is this residential, short-term residential? Um, this is short-term rental. Um, this in, in the application, it says residential. Now is residential defined? Right. Does the state define residential? No. Right. In my opinion, with the shortage of apartments and residential places for people to live, um, I, and I have struggled with this since we did this um, and found out late in the process that this is going to be a short-term rental. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to vote for it. Okay. I did review the all the language within the state's um, requirements and, and regulations. They don't mention anything about long term or short term. Um, they also don't define what they mean as residential. So I did reach out to our MEDC contact. She has a call into the STC. Um, representative, um, I don't believe she has heard back yet, so um, it could be an option that we wait until the next council meeting to make a decision and hopefully we'll hear back um, to have them weigh in on what their perspective is on short term versus a long term rental. Um, and I think when, when we when we started this program a long time ago. Um, short-term rentals weren't on the horizon. I mean, you just they just weren't there. Um, to know that they were coming, I think, we didn't know that. These were just residential places for people to live. Um, now, it's my opinion, uh, people can do what they wanna do with their properties, they can. Um, I encourage them to you know, update them and do all the things they wanna do. And if they want a short-term rental, um, that's fine. I think that we have to have a broader discussion as a group. Do we cap those? Do we, you know, what do we do as a city? Um, uh -huh. Because we're short on places for residents to live, but um, mm. but to give a tax break on an apartment that someone's going to make quite a bit of money on over on a daily basis as opposed to a monthly rental. Uh, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. I guess to, and I get what you're saying, and and, mm -hmm. and having some background on what the program, how the program started, is helpful. My questions would be, a, if if someone say 
that already had an NAZ that was approved, let's just say two years ago, and they got six or nine years on theirs, and they swapped from being a long-term rental to a short-term rental, we would have no say. We would have no, so anybody that's in an, in an NEZ right now that we've approved in the past can do literally anything they want days after we're done. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently when it comes to loopholes, I'm now a genius, but, <laughs> but that, how, how would we, how would we even close that, that gap and still be fair and do what it was proposed to do in the first place? And then my second question would be, if it's not in the, rules of the application now would it be fair to not approve it based on something that's not really in there oh, I get I, it. you I've, know what i mean i've gone back and forth back and forth okay and I, you know i i said when we when we did this okay i agreed with the number um but, but i just it just doesn't go with what the intent of the program was for me right and maybe i'd be different feel different if i wasn't in from the beginning and know what the actual intent was that it says residential but residential is not defined by the state in my mind residential is somebody who lives in the city not a, a, a short-term rental that's not okay. residential right that's part of the problem in the city is that we have more and more people going with short-term rentals which is taking the uh, residencies away from anyone who wishes to come into it, but to give them a tax break or an additional profit is not quite kosher in this light here. You're, you're uh, subsidizing uh, an Airbnb, if you will, uh, off of the taxpayers, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I don't... But, I'm if, sorry. Oh is there a mission statement involved with NEZ? There was nothing. It, would it be possible to go back and revisit that language? and perhaps add some kind of codicil that wouldn't allow for a grandfather clause for anybody who's already used it with the spirit of and the intent of the original NEZ. I'm not sure. Those are legal questions. Yeah, I, I think we do legal questions. We do need to go back through and reevaluate the program just in general because it's been probably many years since it's been reviewed. So I think that's one thing that will take on soon. I think the other thing is understanding from the STC what their perspective is on it. One thing to note too is that when I did research, the STC is the only organization that can revoke a certificate. So we ask for it though. Right. We, we would have to ask them and they would have to approve it. Just like we learned that before the hard way a few times. <laughs> so we would just want to work out all those details along with them to make sure that is an option. And can we define reside? Can we re define reside as we intend it to mean? Because to me, the the word means to live, and residential is closely connected, which means or at least implies. A correlation to living someplace for a, a set amount of time and this in effect makes it in a, a, a hotel Here, here's where i'm struggling with it and i have to agree with the mayor on this too is that we're not being asked uh what we think or what we believe or what residential is we're being asked to review what is in place as of now um <laughs> This one bit me a while ago when I had to rule on an ordinance that I voted against, <laughs> but I had I have to you know look at what the ordinance or how it was written. So uh, for me, if there's not a clear definition at this current time and you have an application in front of you that basically is saying it meets all the requirements and we we've, we've scored it and it goes for six points. That's what I struggle with. Now, I, I don't say I disagree with residential versus short term, but we're not asked to do that at this time. We can look into that in the future, but for this particular application, these are the rules that we have now. So even though we may not like it, I, I, I struggle with that because I look at the guidelines that we have and, you know, what was again. What the purpose <laughs> of this abatement? Well, for I figure that is the, the, the bottom line portion. The purpose of the abatement was to encourage businesses to construct or rehab apartments above for residential purposes. It's for residential housing. And I don't see short term as 
that. But I think because this has been in place for a long, long time, and when we put this in place, short-term rentals weren't a yeah, it just yeah. weren't a thing. Is it the same as canoe properties that got an MEC? Mm -hmm. It's the same situation, right? They use theirs as short term, I believe, right now. Mm -hmm. If it was known at that time that they were going to be short term, I don't know because that would have been before my time. But that is how they're being used currently. So it's currently people that are using mm -hmm. uh, use this, and now that turn those into short term. So it is definitely something that should be looked into. Yeah. For me, that's I kind of explain where I'm at. You know, that's kind of hard. Um, I don't know. Um, it, I guess if there's no rush to, um, what is the, what's the timeline again on this? It's, we have 60 days from the date they turned in their application. So if we postponed it until the next meeting, we would still be within the 60 days. I, application was submitted on April 10th. Okay. I'll propose for some definitions back, some clarification from the state. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's That's definitely. fine. Let's do yeah. that. Okay. Um, I would move that we postpone our next meeting. Very good. Second for table. I'm not saying that word. <laughs> so you're postponing it to the May 15th meeting? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. And then you'll let us know, I guess, at that point, what those answers are. Thank you. Teal. Who was the second on that motion? Cindy. I don't know if you had one, do you? I have a second. Cindy oh. second. Um, Councilmember <laughs> Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? No. Mayor Walagora? No. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Okay. All right. Next up is Kelgon Carbon Contract Renewal for Granular Activated Carbon. And City Engineer Steve Schultz is here. Say that five times yeah. fast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Calgon Carbon Corporation has been the low bid provider for the carbon used on our filter beds at the water production plant since we started utilizing it in 1999. The city has been re utilizing reactivated carbon for the past six years since 2017. In late 2022, Calgon Carbon Corporation contacted the city and Veolia to alert them that testing indicated that the current carbon could not be reactivated and a changeout using virgin carbon is imminent. They have provided the attached proposal with six semi-annual semi installments of $57,596 for a total cost of $345,576. This fee covers the cost of supply, delivery, and installation of the virgin carbon. They also perform annual tests on granular carbon as requested by the city. This process has worked well in the past and the city has been very satisfied with the products delivered and the workmanship of the Calgon employees during the removal and replacement process. Calgon has been the only bidder since 1999 for this product, with the exception of once in 2011, and that bid was substantially higher with no offer for a payment plan. Calgon's product is manufactured domestically, and they are currently re reserving enough to handle our project. It is my recommendation as city engineer that the city council approve the contract with Calgon Carbon Corporation for the 2023 carbon changeout in the amount of $345,576, being six semi-annual installment payments of $57,596. Funding is budgeted annually in the water fund treatment plant supplies line item for this. And when you do approve it, you can approve it with, I forgot to put the signature in here, it, it could be Rachel that signs it, so you can approve it with uh, with Rachel signing the, the agreement. What is the average life expectancy of new carbon? I mean, the the new would be it'd be like three years, and then we would get it reactivated, which is a little cheaper than the virgin. Um, and like I said, currently we're on we've been on we've been on reactivated since 2017, so it's it's about three years. Three years. Yeah. What well, question I have, Mr. Mayor? That's all I have. I remember when we kind of seemed like we started this program with them mm -hmm. then 17 that was yep. well it first. 99 actually when we first started it to, even to reactivate oh well to, to reactivate was in 05 i think was the first reactivation okay somehow remember that there you go i have no questions no time for a motion i move that we approve the contract with Calgon Carbon Corporation for the 2023 carbon changeout in the amount of 
$345,576. And yeah, the part about with authorized by Rachel. With authorization by Rachel. Second. Support. That's a third. <laughs> Fourth? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear. That's number Noak? Yes. I'm getting my new That's ears tomorrow. Yes. Mayor Wall Gora? Aye. Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Council Member Mitchell? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> Motion carried. All right, thank you. Next up is the City Tree Program Renewal Recommendations. Great. Prattscape LLC has been the city's awarded contractor for planting trees that have previously been removed between the sidewalk and street since it was bid out in 2016. The city of Alpena has a right to extend the contract for five additional one-year periods if both parties can mutually agree upon prices. In no case shall the contract extend beyond December 31st of 2023. If we cannot agree on prices for a contract extension, the existing contract will be allowed to expire and the contract be rebid. Doug Pratt, owner of Prattscape LLC, uh, has requested an increase of $25 per bush for the 2023 contract for a total of $75 for each one planted and $425 per tree planted. Price will remain the same as the previous contract. The city continues to replace trees that have been previously removed between sidewalk and street while funds are made available. It is anticipated that approximately 30 trees will be planted with $15,000 allotted in 23-24 budget with various funds, within various funds. It is my recommendation as city engineer to renew the contract with Prattscape LLC for the 2023 with the proposed renewal price of $75 per bush and the current price of $425 per tree planted. Steve, one relative question to this too. I just was recently asked this. If a citizen wants to plant a tree between the sidewalk and the street, do they contact the uh, city engineering for approval on that? They they do. What we have is a tree partnership program that we do offer. Um, there's uh, a lot to it, a lot of um, guidelines as far as distances from existing trees, types of trees you can plant. But we do, um, we offer half up to $100 for each um, like ornamental tree planted and then half up to $150 for each like full full size street tree planted. Um, that, you know, we used to say, well, you know, while the budgets exist and in whatever, because we used to have a lot of requests for it, we don't have as many requests for it now, but um, so we're able to fulfill most of those if people have requests. The, the, the stipulation that we do have is, is sizing on those. Um, usually one and three quarters to two inch diameter on those is kind of what we require to to have them, you know, kind of sustain themselves uh, after they first get planted. And then also a, a year warranty from whoever plants it for you, because that's what we get through our contractors. So um, we just ask that and that that information is available on the city website. People can pull that pull that up and, and do that. And, you know, also they're more than wel welcome to plant their own tree, given the same uh, you know, all the same guidelines. And if they wanted to fund it 100% themselves, they could, but we just have to approve the location and the spacing and such and all that, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We do have the uh, Tree Park Improvement Fund. Um, we're gonna use it up though yeah. in this fiscal year. Um, we had 21,000 at the end of fiscal 22, and we're still gonna have like $418 left, but use that up in 24. Yeah, definitely. Yep. But then in, in in the past, before we had that, we readily available, we also just budgeted out of the street tree or budgeted out of the major and local street funds to plant trees. So we just, you know, we, we picked an amount each year to spend on that. So we do do that sometimes. Okay. Awesome. That's all I have is for you. Very good. I don't have any questions. I move we approve the renewal of the tree planting contract with Prattscape LLC with a renewal price of $75 per bush, $425 per tree. Second. <clears throat> Councilmember Welchuk? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Next is the water production plant clear well design recommendation. All right. 
In March, the city received proposals for the design and construction inspection services for the clear wells at the water production plant. After reviewing the two proposals and due to the complexity of the project, staff felt it was also necessary to request that each consultant be able to present their proposals in person and be available for questions. On April 12th, both engineering staff and Viola representatives sat for presentations from both consultants. Within the proposals, both consultants provided their project team, fee structure, similar projects completed, project timeline, and an estimated cost for their services. Um, as seen in the, in the chart, um, the cost for services is very similar. And after their presentation, staff felt that either firm has the ability and the capacity to design and inspect a project suitable, to, to, suitable for the city's needs. The largest discrepancy between the proposed projects was the estimated construction cost. Both firms were informed of the $6 million in funding available from the Michigan Enhancement Grant. Fishbeck proposed an excellent solution and chose to include many improvements that were planned as future CIP items and designed the necessary upgrades associated with those items. While this created an outstanding project, it was also estimated at almost double the amount that we had secured in funding. HRC provided several solutions with options that could be retained or deleted based upon, based upon expected pricing at the time of bidding. This allowed for a proposed project that satisfied our needs and was close to our available funding amount, but could also be modified and improved if pricing allowed. With a likelihood of nine to 10 month design and the extensive schedule of the construction phase, material and supplies availability will become a concern. Fishbeck is proposing tanks constructed from precast sections, which are provided primarily by two companies, both of which are scheduling projects out into 2024 already. HRC is proposing poured in place walls, which are not subject to external supply schedules and also have a larger seasonal window for construction. After much, much discussion amongst staff, we felt that you know either, either firm had the knowledge and ability to provide a satisfactory project. HRC provided a more well-rounded solution that resolved the main focus of the clear well replacement, but could also fit within our allotted funding. It is my recommendation as city engineer that council authorize staff to execute an agreement with HRC at the hourly rates established within their proposal and begin the clear well design process. We've been uh, looking at this project for quite a while. Quite a while. It's always been the one like how are we going to get this done? And it seems like we have some funding possibility of some funding in front of us. I mean, we were, we're talking about this at the beginning of my term. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's been a long time coming. So it's nice to see that we're able to move forward and kind of stay within that funding as well. So yeah, thank you for all your work on that. <laughs> Questions? A lot of staff time. Yeah, a lot of Charlie time on on this particular one too. He spent a lot of time looking for money that uh, we never got, and then we were finally able to secure something. So are you good? I don't have any questions either. Okay. All right. So we authorize staff to execute an agreement with HRC at the hourly rates established within their proposal and begin the clear well design process. Second. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Noah? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, next and last is the Veolia contract adjustment, Steve. All right. Following Veolia's merger with Suez in 2022, the parent company looked to enhance the overall quality of life for its staff and in turn maintain the operation levels of qualified employees necessary to continue the excellent service that they've always provided to the city of Alpena. Their research indicated that over the last several years, a substantial deficiency in pay for the Alpena staff had occurred when compared with the utility industry standard. After several discussions, Veolia staff proposed that the city share in an increase to the contract with the city increasing its payment for the normal con contracted services and Veolia passing this increase onto its, its employees, as well as adding an equal amount in the form of raises to bring staff closer to the industry standard pay. Earlier this year, the city did something similar with the DPW union contract. In an effort to increase pay to conform more with market levels, the contract was opened earlier and a raise of 5% was passed along to DPW employees beginning on February 20th, 2023, instead of waiting until July 1st as per normal. The Veolia Contract Compensation Adjustment Clause sets the in increase in labor compensation to the same percentage as the yearly increase for the DPW contract. 
So per the contract, Veolia staff would see the same 5% increase beginning on July 1 when the DPW contract would have gone into effect. City staff feels that it would be appropriate to mirror the same timeline as a DPW adjustment and begin the increase retroactively on February 20th, 2023. Future yearly increases will mirror the DPW contract in times. During the budgeting process, city staff accounted for these increases in the current and fis next fiscal years and the budget will be proposed as such, or was proposed as such. I wasn't sure where I was gonna end up on the agenda, so. <laughs> Um, Mike Collins, Veolia Alpena project manager, has indicated his support and gratitude for this proposal in the attached memo. Further, Mike states that the additional compensation on Veolia's part will also be retroactive. For the reasons stated above, I recommend as city engineer that the council approve the Veolia contract compensation adjustment to be retroactive to February 20th, 2023. So basically all we're voting on here is to make it retroactive to February because they would have received this Per the contract in on July one anyway, but they were asking for this increase, you know, kind of ahead uh, before this, and so we we agreed since we opened up the DPW contract early, we thought we'd just mirror it. It just made sense. So. Okay, it does make sense to me. Yep, we did. Yeah. No, the eight the eight three hour meetings. Does she have to redo it? I don't have any either. Everybody else set? I move we approve the VA contract uh, compensation adjustment retroactive to February 20th, 2020. Second. Proton Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nawab? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? Yes. And Mayor Walgora? Aye. Mr. Mayor, I move we adjourn to closed session to discuss pending or threatened litigation involving Michigan Tax Tribunal. Second. Or Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? <laughs> Councilmember Walchek? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Excellent. That in because you're supposed to say, Mr. Chair, I moved the wheelchair. Is that right? <laughs> I wonder why you're here. This conference bit. will now be recorded. I move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my opportunity to. Oh, yeah. <laughs>